you're actually testing against the requirements. And requirements is a topic they address in AADE, the analysis and design part. You turn things that your customer want, or maybe you, you yourself want, in your application is properly specified, we call that requirements, and that the class that you are building indeed meets these requirements. And test-driven test -driven development of test-driven design, or whatever you want to call it, is no, nothing special, it's not magic. It's actually quite simple, because in most cases, writing down your tests, as in, see, well, this is the requirement, oh, I have to test this, is typically simpler than writing the implementation. And I'm an, uh, a student, I'm human, I make errors too, and I learned the hard way that if you write a program and it's a tad of complex and you make an error in the program, you tend to make it more complex instead of making it simple. And this is exactly what the test-driven paradigm does for you. You do exactly what the requirement says, and then the code does exactly what the tests say it should do. And if not, the test will say, uh-uh, it's not good. And it's a game also. If I look at you, I see that you're sitting in front of a green area, and that is what some people think is the preferable color of tests. But I say a red test is a good test, because a red test shows its purpose in life, namely, showing that your code is wrong, your implementation is wrong. That is, in a lifetime of a true test, the test should at least have been read once. And if you then improve the test, change the test, it must again be read at least once to show that the test is able to show that your requirement is not yet met, has not yet been met. That is how you say, how you should say that. Yeah, so that's, uh, that is what this letter slide is all about. And of course, I should do that in a more calmly fashion. This is the content, this is an introduction. And uh, test-wise, uh, that's why a good test, it breaks, it broke things or it breaks things. And this is a proper test, yeah? So if you want your class, uh, your test class to have a proper job, then it smashes your code and it tries na nasty things to the class that you're trying to develop and see if it can withstand any any damage the thing that you want to do in the end if you would do that to a car and you would be test driven testing and you want to avoid damages to the vehicle then you probably uh, end up with a tank but in this case the test is not so much about the vehicle but about the protection of the passengers. And that's why you have these dummies inside and you have these, um, these sensors inside and they see <coughs> this smash of the head against the dashboard it was, uh, well, okay. It hurt, but he survived, he or she survived. So that is what this test is about. And you might be able to see the back of the, the, the dummy and the airbag, bang, doing like something like that. It, uh, it will cost you your eardrums, but uh, in any way, your life will be saved. So, a good test is a red test. Okay, engineers use tools. I have some of them. You know what this is? <laughs> yeah, okay. And you know what this is? And what this is called? Good. Okay. Our tools are, of course, software tools. Because we build software, we make our own tools, or some colleagues, or some people that uh, have the experience or get paid for it or have it as a hobby, create tools. And these tools are typically software parts, like NetBeans IDE is a tool. And as a typical power tool, these tools can also be adapted. That is, if you get to go to the Lidl, you can get some power tool with a battery inside, you can put a, a drilling head on front of it and something that, sh that saws and whatnot. Same with NetBeans. You can add plugins, that's one part. You can configure it to your liking, but you also can add libraries, in particular libraries to your projects. And these libraries are the libraries that you use for your testing. 
And you have been using them because the MOOC programs that you got, that you worked upon, the MOOC projects that you worked upon, worked with, are full of tests. And if you would look at the test, um, you'll see that you will, oh, whoa, this is the really uh, difficult stuff. It is. The way that the MOOC tests your code is way more difficult than you really need to do if you do test-driven. I, as a person, would like to have started with test-driven, but my colleague said, well, don't do that yet. But that is the gist. Test-driven development, that is writing your test, is trivial, is simple. And we'll do that today as well. Yeah? So, uh, this is a, a sheet, I, a sheet I, I, I lent, I borrowed from uh, Mr. Uh, Zobeck. This is about uh, levels of testing. This is what you do. So this is just a short narrative. This is what we typically do when we are developing classes. And if sometimes, and often, no, often enough, you have a few classes, one or two or three maybe, that cooperate, then you might be on the next level, com component testing, that is you combine things. We'll go into more details later on, but that's what we do. And then you do integration tests and you put more parts together until you have the application. And then at the, the, the top drawn line, so the top triangle, you might do automated GUI tests. On the bottom end, the tests are cheap. You can run them very quickly. They run in milliseconds or no more than a second or something like that. And if you go up, they take more time. And they are more expensive, not only to run, but also to write. So that is what uh, typically happens. On the bottom, you do your testing as much as possible. And, on, and uh, you relax your testing. You might want to relax your testing a bit because that has to do with e economics. Um, often enough, you see the reverse, this. That is, the people are testing, and this is what the tester's job does. They have the application, and they, they click on, and they do all th kind of things. It's a very boring job because you have to click this and fill in that, and then, is this okay? Yes, and then do check. That's often manual testing, and that is has been uh, a way of working for a long time. Modern software industry, whether you're writing Java, .NET, C Sharp. Uh, JavaScript, you have seen that yesterday in the colloquium, or you might have seen that yesterday in the colloquium, um, and uh, says, every class that you write should have a unit test. Why? Because typically your class lands in the library, and people that want to use your library want to rely on that library. They want to think, well, I can use that without having to think. I only need to read what the thing does and should do and how I, 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 I use it, but it shouldn't break during my usage. So all these things have been tested. And that is what we're going to do. So what is the answer to the question on the bottom bullet? Sergey, what's the answer to the question at the bottom bullet? I didn't understand it. That's okay. What is the answer to the question on the bottom bullet? Yes? Sorry? The pyramid, yeah, the pyramid, as in B. I, I wanted to hear B. Okay, you can stay. Yeah, because that is what it, that is that is indeed true. So there is a pyramid on the top. You have your application on the bottom. You have the libraries that you use or part of the libraries that you use. So think JDK or think uh, some library that you import. You typically use only a part of such a library, um, but these should be thoroughly tested. Yeah. And certainly, if you're working OO style, as we do in Java, and languages that are similar, JavaScript, TypeScript, all these languages, then you want to write a test that validates your class. There's one tiny issue, and that is one of the reasons that a test should be read first. Because a test can never prove that your code is correct. That it can't do that because the test only tests its part of the specification. It cannot tell, and even all the tests combined cannot tell if your code is correct. If you interpreted the requirements in the wrong way, well, then you can test anything, but it will test this wrong thing. So test cannot prove your code. The purpose of a test to show that things are wrong. But it is, that means that 
when you're working on your program and you modify your programming, that is typically what you do and you will do in PSC in Project 2. You will start with a tiny program and then build up from that program. So you will be modifying the your classes or the combinations of classes. Then every time you modify those classes, you will rerun your tests. And because the tests are cheap, it's no problem to run the test. You simply do click on the test button and your tests are rerun. And you, if you see red, you, oh, what I did had an effect. I had a purpose in life because I made my test red. Now you know what to repair. If you write test properly and document your test properly, they say, hey, if this goes wrong, it might mean this. Yeah. Your red test says that, and then you um, can improve on that. You can en uh, enhance or improve, add to the code what you, what you need to do, what the requirement says, and what has been, um, has been made, made concrete in your tests. You uh, you've, you've adapted or rewritten uh, a test that does the proper thing. So this is uh, motivation, why testing? And now let's get into the real thing, do some testing. And what I will do, I'll show the, the parts of the testing, but then I'll go shortly over the rest, the remainder of the slides, because I have two more topics, uh, or maybe it's three or four, I don't know. Uh, what we should also talk about, as you, if you look at, at, at the lesson plan, is we should also look at the collections, and we should uh, look at the comparable and comparator, things that uh, you might have seen in, in PSC1, maybe simply rehearsing that, because it also helps you to to understand a bit. And also I wanted to talk about uh, a few things that you can do and improve your work in uh, using NetBeans. That is what it says on the top of my li list. And I should help you to draw a small class diagram. But with that class diagram goes um, goes uh, a short question. I must, uh, must remember that. So first let's go to the uh, search thingies. And that's what you see. We'll be using JUnit. There are more uh, testing libraries uh, in Java. Uh, TestNG is, uh, is another one. Uh, there's a JUnit 5 uh, at the corner that's already available. We will not be using that at in this semester, but might be using that in the next semester. JUnit 5 is uh, available in NetBeans 10 and, and up, uh, but not yet in, in NetBeans 8, but we'll stick to NetBeans 8 for, the se for this semester. So yeah, that's also something that we should agree upon. Um, and we should also look at the, mo at the, at the details of, uh, of uh, JUnit. Um, well, first of all, Java as a, as a language itself can already test because assert, the thing above, is a Java keyword. You cannot use it as a variable name. Yep. Assert has a specific meaning. And this applies to some other languages as well. C has a similar facility, but this is uh, what you can do. You, so you can write something like assert that the argument's length, that is the number of parameters that you gave on the command line is bigger than zero in this case. Yeah. This assert, this type of assert, only works if you turn it on by doing something special in the second uh, big bullet, that is you turn on you enable the assert when starting your Java, Java application. Now this is a very poor man's way of testing things or maybe making sure that thi certain things are available. You could, for instance, test the availability of a file in your, um, in, in, in your directory, for instance. And, and that is a, an easy way to, to do that. Um, okay, but this is not a standard way that we do our testing. The standard way of doing our testing is looking at what is provided as methods inside assert Java. Dot, uh, uh, that is one part of the JUnit library. So the official name is org JUnit assert.java. And in this class, you have a, a number of static methods. They're all static. And the reason for that is you can easily import all of these methods into your own class and then call them by their short name. And uh, what you should, uh, should do is or remember that these uh, test methods all take at least one. No, one, there's one with zero. But typically one or two or three or four parameters. The preferred uh, set of parameters is for JUnit 4, first you specify a message. As in, if this test broke, 
then you know what's wrong. Like, like um, um, the student is not, at, um, um, it's not over age, or how do you call it? Um, uh, there's an there's a expression. Yeah, it has to do with maturity, I don't know how. Of age, yeah, the student is not of age. That is it's a legal thingy, uh, 18 years in some countries, 21 years in other countries, and 23 um, um, in other countries. Doesn't matter. So student is not of age, and then you do your test, and then you do your thingy. There's a, so you have an expected value, you put the expected value first, and then the actual value, that is the thing that you find when while executing your program second, or third, because passage, expected, actual, and then for some types, in particular the double and float types, you also specify a precision, uh, or how it's called, a delta. The delta is uh, the delta value. That is, it's, it's okay if it's within this margin from the expected value. No? So, now you have uh, quite a few of these uh, things. That's, I call that a zoo. That's a zoo. These are the, the things that you can expect. So there's an assert true. There's an assert false, there's an assert null, there's an assert not null, there's an assert equals, which is your biggest friend because that's one of the things that you would use most often, and there's a assert same. And there's a quiz question on, on the slide as well. What's the difference between same and equal? Thank you. Yes? Like, uh, equals is, is, is like uh, for the for the object that is uh, looking same like the uh, other object. Yes. The same is the uh, the really the physical yeah, more or less physical object. Yeah, I like both of them, but they all tend to be wushy wushy. It's not very specific, precise. That's why I have my toolkit. I don't know if it works. It will be big shit, and uh, the viewers in the video can't see it, but I don't care. <laughs> this is this is what I call a skipping rope. But in this class, I'll call it a reference. And when I'm referring to an object, like referring to Florian Bloom, he has a connection. Yeah. And I'll, I'll give another reference to Mr. Van den Ham. You get a pink reference because, well, I found pink first. I found fig f first. Don't, don't think any special of it. Now, assume that you are also a student, and all your properties have the same value. That is, your age is the same. Your hair color is almost the same. Eye color. Mm, don't talk about eye color but the t-shirts are a bit blackish. So we would say that if Mr. Van Ham and I compare these references, then we would say these guys are equal. They are each other's equals. Yes? Assert equals looks if the fields, you know what fields are? What is fields? What is a field of a class? Or an instance, I should say. Don't Oh, it's overwhelmingly quiet here. Properties, properties yes. <laughs> an instance of class is an object, yes. And what is the field of the instance? Properties is a good thing. The int, as in the student value of the instance. So you have a field that is called the age, and there's a field that's called name. All these things, sometimes they are called properties. We call them fields. So field age, field air color, field uh, a, uh, name, field whatever, student number maybe, if that goes into the comparison, are equal to for these students. If the reference that Mr. Van Ham is holding points to the same object, then it apply, then assert same applies. Yes, so same is about comparing the references and making sure that you're talking to the same object. 
in this case. Yeah? Actually, you should hold it in one hand, so you should see the same hand moving. Thank you. Yeah? So that is the difference between same and equal. And for instance, um, if you put something in, in a collection and you want to get it back, often enough, you want the same thing back, not some copy, some clone. Yeah? And that's how you where you would use same instead of equals. If you do equals to the same object twice, you do actual and, uh, and uh, expected is, is, uh, points to the same object, of course, then equals will always say yes. Yes? Because we are looking at the same object and there can't be any difference between the objects. Jean Paul. Well, in, in, the, in the example that I, the question is, um, why do you want to uh, make sure that the same object comes back? There are use cases or business cases, if you will, in which you want to insert something in, uh, in, in a collection, say, or a map or, or whatever, and you want to make sure that no new object has been created, that you get back the same thing. So you refer, you, you, you verify, you assert that the same object is returned so that no extra memory is claimed or whatever. Yeah? So there is a difference between equals and, and same. How do you use them? Uh, oh no, this is about, um, about um, uh, comparing bigger things and sometimes you want to do special things like you, you have a collection, a list say, an array list, and you put in some stuff. And, um, and, this and the example is about um, uh, characters in uh, Lord of the Rings, as, as is obvious, and you can uh, do something like uh, are these elements contained inside the collection? There are libraries that can be added to JUnit, in this, ca uh, this case is a search J, that make your life as a tester way simpler, because otherwise you have to make a loop inside your test and that would be silly, because then you would write a program inside your test and don't do that. Make your tests as simple as possible, but important is you also make them readable as possible. Why? Why is it important that your tests are readable, understandable by your fellow programmer? Sorry? To reuse it? To reuse it, yes, that is one. Please don't copy, the other would be. In the case that you want to change the test and you want to know what it does before, yes, that's also, also a good reason. What else? Yes? Yes, that could be someone from where you left off. It, that is typically the case in F because you want to be able to want to go these classes. You create an instance and you know what uh, all methods are, are available and you can see what parameters are available and how you should use them in with what order. So it's a kind of documentation. Testing produces documentation. And also another thing that is, um, that's why some people tend to call this test-driven design this testing helps you to find methods that are not yet available, but you need to make it testable. Often enough, the methods that you created because of testability want to use a public application program interface or API. That is what you typically do. Um, there's another rule uh, in class. Need another rule, and the rule is the timekeeper because I tend to talk longer than I'm allowed, and you are the timekeeper because he's on the, uh, at the front of the class, and you should tell me to stop uh, at quarter two, three. Then we have a break of 20 minutes, a standard break, yeah, because um, I get tired, you get tired. Actually, you get more tired because you are more more people, but uh, that that happens. The tiredness, your tiredness is higher than mine. Okay, um, sometimes uh, you uh, can't get by with just simple testing, but that is not, not something that we're going to address in the first week. And um, looking at the time, I will address a few other things and a, and a bit of a quizzing stuff. 
And there's an example here, read that in your own time, and there's un unit testing. Yeah, studying this is not very useful in class. Yeah. Because it's much more useful to talk about something new, which, uh, which is interesting because this is boring stuff. Yeah. And boring stuff is never very interesting. So I, I, my, my purpose in this class is, well, to keep you awake. That's one. And the other is that you learn something from it. So the reading this text is not very useful. Okay, there are a few things that we have to name. Well, one, one we already saw. Uh, the things that we call fields are special in classes. So if you don't know what they are, look it up. Another one is method. Method is simple, yes, because that's the things that you can invoke on an instance. So as, as in call a method on a, a class like object to, uh, object to string. For instance, we know that all objects have this uh, have this method. Um, but there's also a few names that we have, and that is introduced by the book, by the author of the book uh, that we advise for this course. That is the um, practical testing with JUnit or something. The orange book that is on the on the front of the website. There's one thing: the class that you're testing is the SUT, and we don't want to call it uh, CUT because it is a bad name in Dutch. That's why we call it SAT, System Under Test, although it's a class under test. And typically when you test a class, you make instances of these classes, and we call these instances or objects. There's also a uh, dependent on comp uh, compo uh, what is it? component. Sometimes you, uh, you need something extra to be able to test a class. For instance, a string that would be an extra class, or an extra class that you create in your business application, in your application, not necessarily business, but you have that in your application. That could be a dependent on component because you need it in your test case. Um, and uh, you see that often used in, in JUnit as a testing framework. Um, oh yes, this is nice because, well, I had a, a discussion with uh, one of my colleagues about what a business is. And if you look at the, in the English dictionary, then business is not, uh, not just uh, things to have to, with, uh, to do with commerce and making a profit and uh, paying your customers or and pay, no, uh, getting money from your customers and paying your employees. No, it's simply what is your purpose? And if you look at the library, uh, sorry, the dictionary, then it says business as a noun can mean it is a role. What's your business? Yeah. And your business is learning at this instant, and my business is teaching, but I'm not a businessman, I'm just a teacher. Or uh, you have a mission, as in uh, what's your business here, what your, why, why you're here, or uh, in a particular field of endeavor, the best in the business, or well, you can, could be best in the business. We want to be best in Java teaching, so you, you know that now. So business logic, is not about business as in commerce, but is what is the purpose of life of the class that we are currently implementing. That is, write your test first and then implement. So now you know. Well, then is test driven. Let's have a look. Yes, then there's st test driven. And test driven says you start at the top at red, you write a test, it should become red. Then you implement something. And uh, then if you do your implementation correctly and your test is any good, then your test becomes green. And when you're done, then you could go back to write your next test or refactor. And it simply means change the application so that it does actually what you want. I would say as a very simplified f a version of refactoring, re remove your system out print lines from your code because they are not functional. You do not change any of the functionality of your code, but your system out print lines might be helpful while you're writing your code. Better still, make sure that you have tests that test all the methods that are you, you are using in your application, and then you do the red, green, refactor cycle. So test, implement, refactor cycle. Okay. Um, there are a few promises, and um, well, that it needs some convincing, but um, the best is, of course, uh, in the proof of the pudding. And Mr. Van Ham uh, and I, we learned um, in uh, times in, in, in our history 
that indeed when you start writing test driven, when you write your test first, you write less code. And the fewer lines you write, the fewer errors you write. Because nothing is perfect. Yes? If you do not write anything, you cannot make any errors. So if you avoid to write complex code by doing it in a test-driven way, then not only will you write less code, the quality of the code will be much better, way better, and the customers will love you because your code doesn't break. Because your tests help to assert or validate that for the test cases that you have, it actually works. Okay, now what you, uh, what you do, this is the bottom line, the fine print, the do's and don'ts. You can re re read that in your own. The bottom line is a good test is a red test. You must always be able to make that test become red again. You must be able to break a piece of code, and if this code is broken, rerun the test, then the test should say, hey, kaput, or something similar. Yeah? Okay, that's that set of uh, slides. Uh, one quiz. Let's see if this still works. One quiz, yes. One quiz. One quiz would be what is a type in Java? What is a type in Java? And if you know, can you give me a few examples? Tell me, what's a type? Yeah, the type of a variable, for instance. Yeah, a string is a type, and int is a, is a type, and integer is a type, and long is a type, and long with a capital L is also a type, but they are different beasts. There are two, typically, I often c I call them two, uh, two main types in Java, as collection types, yes? Like primitive, primitive types? Yeah. Integer, byte, char, long. Uh, double float and the other one would be referential. sorry referential, referential. R reference time but referential I'll, I'll do with reference so you see when we are working with these skipping ropes we are talking about reference types and we'll, we'll see, the, see these skipping ropes more often in class because sometimes they are quite useful yeah so what's the difference why why does Java do that any any clue why does Java have two different types? There are languages that, that mo don't make the distinction. For instance, Ruby doesn't make the distinction. You can say one, as in a di digit one, and do dot print. And that one, it, it appears as if this one prints itself. And, well, this one doesn't have a, a print of its sleeve. And that is what, ja what Ruby does. But Java doesn't do that. Why do you have primitive types and reference types in Java? Any clue? Yes? Yes, so, just ah, so you're saying uh, a reference type, as in a class, for instance, your example would be string, will have many of these primitive types alike uh, characters. Yes, that's, that's true. But why do you have primitive types? Why I need all reference types? It would be much easier, because one type that would be less, and less is better. Yes? If you don't have anything, it can't be broken. Why do you have primitive types in Java? And C sharp is the same thing. Uh, and a few other languages, uh, probably that is the same thing. Um, JavaScript as well, al co although it's not a st strictly typed language. Do you have primitive types? Yes. Maybe save space because you uh, save the information directly into those. Yes, saving space is very good. Next. There's another advantage. Very good. Because the primitive types are very near, if not the same thing, as what your machine does. The Java integer is typically the same integer as your machine has. The machine also has an integer. So working with these integers, Java can say, hey, do that. Machine, do this. And the machine already knows that. So it's only a matter of performance. These primitive types 
make your code run faster. So whenever your application allows it, choose primitive types over stay the box types. But there are few reasons and few uh, places where that might into run into problems. Now, asking what types are. Oh, timekeeper, yes. Y allow me one minute mm -hmm. just to ask the question, and then you may ponder on it during the break, and then after the break, you'll give me the answer. What is a super type? Sergey. Yeah, what is a super type is the question for the break. Please uh, be back in 20 minutes. Thank you.